When the war on drugs was being launched, the man who launched it, Harry Anslinger, said there was one place in the world that proved more than any other that it was going to work. He said if you looked at this place, it would prove that if you cracked down hard enough, if you arrested enough people, if you were consistently tough, drugs and drug gangs would disappear. That place was Baltimore. How's it working out for you? <laughs> I'm really glad to be here. I, I feel like I, before I start, I should kind of apologize for something, which you might be able to tell from my voice, I'm not from here. And I've spent a lot of time in the US, and I've never felt self-conscious about it. Until I was working on this book, I went to Tyler County in Texas. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. If you haven't, don't. Uh, and I went to interview this, this hitman, the only, the only hitman for the worst Mexican drug cartel who's ever made it out and lived to tell the story. He's, uh, he's in prison there. And I went into a branch of Jack in the Box. Do you, do you guys have that in Baltimore? Do you know, you know what it is? It's like a, a fast food chain, uh, which is responsible for at least one of my chins. And I went in there and I said to the woman, can I have like a quarter pounder with cheese? And she said to me, what? And I said, could I, could I have a quarter pounder with cheese? And she said to me, I can't do the accent, I apologize. She said, do you speak English? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, madam, my people invented it. Uh, <laughs> But she didn't laugh. The, um, what I want to talk to you about, as, we, as I said before, it's now a hundred years since drugs were first criminalized. And as I realized we were coming up to this centenary, I had a kind of very personal reason for wanting to think about it. We had a lot of drug addiction in my family. One of my earliest memories was of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And I realized that even though this had been going on for a hundred years, there were loads of really basic questions that I just didn't know the answer to. And that my teachers had never told me, my government had never told me, your government had never told me, no one had told me. Why were drugs banned in the first place? Why do we carry on with the drug war approach when a lot of people think it isn't working? What really causes drug use and drug addiction? And what are the alternatives? And I realize that part of the problem with the drug war, I think, is that we talk about it in such an abstract way. If you read most writing about the drug war, it's like you're sitting in a philosophy seminar arguing about how the world should be. I thought, screw that. I want to find out how it really affects real people all over the world. So I set off on this journey. I didn't think it would be quite as long as it was when I started. But I ended up going across nine countries, 30,000 miles, and just sitting and spending time and talking with loads of different people from a transsexual crack dealer in Brownsville, Brooklyn, to a scientist who spends a lot of time feeding hallucinogens to mongooses to see if they like them. It turns out they do, but only in very specific circumstances. To, to the only country in the world that's ever decriminalized all drugs from cannabis to crack with incredible results. And I think the main thing I took away from this is Almost everything we think we know about this subject is wrong. Drugs are not what we think they are. Drug addiction is not what we think it is. The drug war is not what we've been told it is for 100 years. And the alternatives are not what we think they are. And what I'd like to do, because I tell the story in the book through the stories of real people whose lives were changed one way or another by this war, or the alternatives. I want to talk to you tonight just about five or six of the people that I talk about in the book. One of them's one of your homegirls. Um, in 1939, Billie Holiday stood on stage in New York City and she sang a song called Strange Fruit. It's a song against lynching. Her goddaughter, Lorraine Feather, said to me, you've got to understand how shocking this was to have an African-American woman standing in front of a white audience in a hotel where she was not allowed to walk through the front door. She went through the service elevator singing a song against lynching. And that night, according to her biographer, Julia Blackburn, Billie Holiday received a threat, a warning, from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. They said, stop singing this song. The man who ran that bureau was a guy called Harry Anslinger. He's the most influential person no one's ever heard of. He was the founder. He took over the Department of Prohibition, just as alcohol prohibition is ending. <clears throat> And he had to find a new purpose for his department. And he was driven by two really strong hatreds. One was a hatred of addicts. The other was a hatred of African Americans. This is a guy who was regarded as a crazy racist by the crazy racists in the 1930s, right? He used the N-word in official police memo so often that his own senator said he should have to resign. And Billie Holiday, you look at his files, his writing, he was obsessed. Billie Holiday was 
everything he hated. It was an African-American woman standing up to white supremacy. It was a heroin addict. It was a, you know, he thought jazz, it's really interesting when you read it, he thought jazz was this kind of mongrel, evil music that was disordered and a sign of chaos. And he would write these memos where he'd listen to the lyrics, like when he gets the motion, he thinks he can walk across the ocean. And he'd write, that is what they do think when they use heroin. Billie Holiday grew up here in Baltimore when it was the last city in the United States that didn't even have a sewage system. So she grew up surrounded by the smell of burning feces. She grew up in an area called Pigtown, which gives you some sense of how it was seen. <laughs> See, there's a Pigtown homegirl over there. And, um, and Billie Holiday learned something when she lived here. She made herself a promise. She wasn't allowed in a lot of the stores because she was an African-American. She promised herself she was never going to bow her head to any white man. So when she gets this threat from Harry Anslinger, she says, in effect, screw you. I'm an American citizen. I'll sing my song. I'll do what I want. And that is the point at which the stalking and killing of Billie Holiday began. Harry Anslinger hated employing African Americans. He had a rule that no African American could be the boss of a white guy in his organization. But it was kind of hard to send a a white guy into Harlem to stalk Billy Holiday. It'd be kind of conspicuous. So he employed a man called Jimmy Fletcher. And Jimmy Fletcher's job was to follow Billy Holiday for two years and watch everything she did. And Jimmy Fletcher fell in love with Billy Holiday because she was so amazing. And all his life, he felt ashamed of what he did next. He busts her. She's put on trial. She said the trial was called the United States versus Billy Holiday, and that's how it felt. She's sent to prison. And when Billy Holiday gets out, she can't sing. You needed a license. You needed a cabaret performance license to perform anywhere where alcohol was served, and they wouldn't give it to her. Her friend Yolanda Bavan said to me, what is the cruelest thing you can do to a person? It's to take away the thing we lo they love. It's what we do to addicts all over the world today. I went out with a female chain gang in Arizona and made to wear t-shirts saying, I was a drug addict and dig graves. They're never going to work again. They've got a criminal record. And like those women, a lot of those women, Billie Holiday, in all that suffering, relapses. When she's in her early 40s, she collapses in New York, and she's taken to a hospital. The hospital refuses to have her because she's an addict. They take her to another hospital. She says to one of her friends that the narcotics agents aren't finished with her. She says, they're going to kill me in there. Don't let them. They're going to kill me in there. On her hospital bed, she's diagnosed with liver cancer. They arrest her on a hospital bed. They handcuff her to the hospital bed. I interviewed the last man who, who was still alive, who was in that room, Eugene Callender, an incredible man. They take away all her candies, all her toys, everything she has, and she goes into withdrawal because she hasn't got any heroin. One of her friends, Maylee Dufty, manages to insist the doctors give her methadone. She starts to recover. Ten days later, they cut off the methadone and she dies. One of her friends said she looked like she had been violently wrenched from life. But here's the thing. Billie Holiday insisted on singing her song. She would go anywhere they'd have her. No matter what they did, she always sang Strange Fruit. And it really helped me to think about the addicts in my life, because I think there's going to be people in this room who are addicts in their life. And if we're honest, there's a bit of a drug warrior in all of us. And there's a bit of all of us that looks at them and thinks someone should stop you and feels really angry some of the time. And it really helped me to know the addicts can be heroes. Her friend Annie Ross, Billie Holiday's friend Annie Ross, said to me, Billie Holiday wasn't weak. Billie Holiday was as strong as she could be. I wanted to understand how those dynamics continue into today. And I was introduced to someone, one of the best people I know, a former transsexual crack dealer in Brownsville, Brooklyn, called Chino Hardin. Chino was conceived in 1980 when his mother, who was a crack addict, was raped by his father, who was an NYPD officer. He's a child of the drug war in the purest sense. And Deborah, his mother, gets AIDS very early in the AIDS crisis because nothing was done to prevent the transmission of AIDS among drug users. In fact, the thing that, would, that did help and in lots of places prevented the spread, the distribution of clean needles was a crime. People were prosecuted under the Drug Paraphernalia Act. So her mother, his mother dies. And when he's 13, he becomes a crack dealer on his corner. And Chino really helped me to understand the dynamics behind drug dealing and what happens with drug dealing. I didn't check, but I'm guessing there's a liquor store on this street. There certainly isn't one far away, right? If we go into that, <laughs> if we go into that liquor store, any of us tonight, and, I'm, and we try to steal the beer or vodka, and I apologize if you feel like doing that after I speak, um, they'll call the cops. And the cops will come and take us away, right? That liquor store doesn't need to be violent. 
If we go up to the local weed dealer or the local coke dealer and we try to steal their goods, they can't call the police, right? The police will come and arrest them. They've got to be terrifying. They've either got to fight you or better yet, establish a reputation for being so frightening that you won't dare to take them on. And even though Chino is one of the most empathetic people I know, Chino had to learn to be terrifying. Chino had to discipline his gang, his four friends on his block, by whipping them if they got out of line. Chino had to shoot at people. Chino had to be aggressive and violent. The sociologist Philippe Bourgeois says that prohibition creates a culture of terror. This has got nothing to do with drugs, right? If you banned milk, and people still wanted to buy milk, exactly the same dynamics would happen. This is not about drugs. This is about prohibition. You will have noticed that the liquor store over there, they're not going and shooting the people who work in the drink aisle at Walmart, right? That never happens. Under alcohol prohibition, alcohol sellers were killing each other. So what happened is that Chino starts to rise through the crypts. He becomes a senior member of it. He's first of all sent to a youth prison called Sparford to send Chino and his four fellow gang members to Sparford Prison, a youth detention facility. Cost a million dollars a year. I don't know if there's anyone here who can think of something better we could do in Brownsville, Brooklyn with a million dollars a year than send five kids to be in stone cells. But if you've got any ideas, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, Chino rises. His whole life is malformed. He starts using crack because, as he put, put it to me, he, I wanted to know what my mother chose over me. And when Chino's in his early 20s, he gets out of prison and he starts to read about the drug war. And he discovers something that blows his mind. This isn't a law of nature. This isn't something that just happens in the world. It's not like a tsunami. It's not like a hurricane. This is a political choice. What happened to Chino's mother, what happened to Chino, his life in Rikers, his life in a prohibited market, all of that, it didn't have to happen. Chino became a campaigner against the war on drugs. His first campaign was to shut down Sparford, the youth prison he was put in. And he succeeded. Sparford no longer exists. Chino is also a really articulate exponent of explaining how much this is still about what it was about with Billie Holiday. When Harry Anslinger found out Billie Holiday was a heroin addict, he also found out Judy Garland was a heroin addict. He told Judy Garland to take slightly longer vacations and told the studio she was going to be fine. Spot the difference. 17% of the people who sell drugs in the United States are African American. They make up 65% of the people who go to prison for it. Just outside Baltimore, at the same time that Chino was selling on his block, a person called Lee Maddox was standing on the I-95. Lee Maddox was a cop, and she was arresting anyone she could find who she suspected of being a drug user. Lee had long hair and a hot temper. Her job was to get numbers. She knew that if you busted people, you get to, the cops get to keep 80% of everything they take. If they find you with coke in your car and they, see, they can take your car away, they get to keep 80% of it. It was paying her wages. Lee was thrilled. Lee could not have been a stronger believer in the war on drugs. Lee signed up to be a cop because her best friend Lisa, who she grew up with, they used to share an ID, they looked just alike, they were always together, was murdered by what she believed was a drug gang. She signed up to be a cop with one reason in mind, to destroy drug gangs. That was why she went into it. But Lee is an honest person, and Lee noticed something. When you're a cop, if you arrest a rapist, the next week there's less rape in your town. If you arrest a dealer, well, no one thinks there's less dealing. There's always someone else on the corner. But crucially, Lee noticed something even more important. If you bust dealers, the murder rate actually goes up. And Lee was like, why would this be? How can that be? And what she discovered is that if you say Chino, Chino establishes a reputation for terror on his block, he controls his block. If you kill Chino or arrest Chino, you just trigger a war between rival gangs to control his patch. You start a turf war. Huge numbers of people are killed in these turf wars. The Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman said there are 10,000 deaths a year in the United States, three 9-11s as a result of those turf wars. And they're not just dealers. There are a lot of people being caught in the crossfire. I tell the story in, this, in my book about Tiffany Smith, a three-year-old girl who's playing on her stoop in West Baltimore gets hit in the crossfire. And Lee didn't know what to do with this insight. And then another of her best friends, Ed Totley, an agent who also believed very strongly in the drug war, goes to do an undercover drugs bust, and he's shot by the dealer, who just thought he was a guy, another dealer. And Lee goes and looks at Ed's body, and she thinks, I can't do this anymore. And Lee quit the police force, and she retrained as a lawyer. And now she spends her time getting the convictions quashed wherever she can 
for the drug arrests that she did as a cop. Lee is actually here today. I'm so proud to know her. And she's an extraordinary person. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to know what life is like on the supply routes. This dynamic we're talking about, this dynamic of creating, as Charles Bowden, the writer, put it, the war on drugs creates a war for drugs. That's horrific in a lot of places. In this city, it's one of the worst. There's one city I can think of where it's even worse, Ciudad Juarez. The supply route into the United States for most drugs runs through Ciudad Juarez. It's on the border with Texas on El, in El Paso. So I went there. I would stay every night in El Paso because it's not safe to stay in Juarez. It's the deadliest city in the world. And every morning I would walk across the bridge and it was bizarre because you walk across the bridge into what feels like an American city. There's a KFC, right? There's a Denny's. You can buy a flat screen TV. And murder has effectively been legalized. There is a 2% murder conviction rate in Juarez and that 2% didn't do it. And the way it really helped me to understand the story of what's happened there is through the story of a woman called Maricela Escobedo. Maricela never took drugs in her life. She never sold drugs in her life. No one in her life used or sold drugs. Had no interest in it. She happened to live in Ciudad Juarez. She had a daughter called Ruby who was 14 years old. Maricela was a nurse, but she also had like a woodwork store. And one day a guy turns up at her woodwork store called Sergey. Uh, Sergey. He turns up and he says, look, I've got a kid. I need some work, will you help me? Have you got anything I can do? And Maricela is a kind of soft-hearted person, so she said, yeah, okay, I'll give you a job. And Sergei starts to flirt with her daughter, who's 14, and Maricela's like, get out of here, right? And Ruby runs away to go off with, with Sergei. And Maricela goes to the police, as anyone here would do, and says, look, this guy's 21, and he's having an affair with my daughter, who's 14, you've got to stop him. And the police do nothing, and Maricela's a bit puzzled. She's angered, she tries to get her daughter back, her daughter won't come back, she tries to keep her daughter in her life, her daughter gets pregnant, Maricela's heartbroken, but she tries to, you know, she goes and sees her all the time, Ruby has a baby. And one day, Maricela turns up, and Ruby's not there, but her baby's there, and Sergei says, Ruby ran away, she went off with another man. And Maricela says, no, 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 she didn't run off with another man and leave her child with you, I know she wouldn't do that. But he says, well... That's what happened. So Maricela decides to distribute leaflets all over Juarez, saying, have you seen my daughter? Nothing happens. After a while, a kid called Anahel calls her, and he's terrified, and she has to drive out far into the desert with him. And he says to her, I helped dispose of your daughter's body. Sergei killed her. I can tell you where we dumped the body. And she goes and she finds the bits of her daughter's body. And she goes to the police and she says, you've got to do something, and the police won't do anything. And she still doesn't quite understand why. And Maricela eventually campaigns and she manages to get him put on trial. And in the witness box, Sergei breaks down and he apologises to her and he says, I'm sorry for what I did. And he admits what he did. And two weeks later, he's acquitted. And he disappeared. And Maricela discovers that Sergei worked for the Zetas, the Mexican drug cartel. Now, if you imagine a housing project in Baltimore, let's say 5 or 10% of the economy in that housing project is in the hands of armed criminal gangs selling drugs. That housing project is going to be a lousy place to live. 70% of the economy of Ciudad Juarez is in illegal drugs. They can outbid the state. When I first went there, I was being shown around by a great guy called Julian Cardona, who's the Reuters correspondent. He kept introducing me to people who'd been killed by the police. And I said, you know, Julian, this is important, but I need to meet people who've been killed by the cartels. And he just laughed and said, no, you don't understand, Johan. When the cartels want to kill someone, they pay the police to do it. Maricela would not accept that there was no justice in northern Mexico in the age of prohibition. She would not accept it. She decided to track down Sergei. She turns herself into a detective. She quits her job, and she spends three years tracking him all over Mexico. She becomes a crack detective. And with her friends, who are mothers of the missing, she walks across the desert. She walks thousands of miles. And after three years, she finds him. And she goes to the police. And they let him get away again. And she goes and stands outside the governor's mansion in Chihuahua. And she leads this protest. And she's become a symbol of everything. And she stands outside and she makes this amazing speech about how people in Mexico deserve justice. And in front of all the police, a man walks up to her and shoots her in the head. A woman whose wages you pay, Michelle Leonhardt, the head of the Drug Enforcement Agency, was asked about the 60,000 deaths of civilians in Mexico in the last seven years. 
and I urge you to look up the clip. She said it was a sign of success in the war on drugs. When I went and talked to Berta, Maricela's best friend in her shack in Juarez, I said to her, it was something that really stayed with me, what she said. I said to her, weren't you afraid? And she said, we were terrified. But sometimes your love for your kids is stronger than your fear. And there's something in the hope of that that I contrast with what Michelle Leon Hart said that really stayed with me. Another thing I wanted to understand was what causes drug addiction. If you had said to me four years ago, what causes heroin addiction, I would have looked at you like you were a little bit simple-minded, and I would have said, heroin causes heroin addiction, right? For 100 years, we've been told a story that's so obvious, it's become part of our common sense. It's really easy. We think that if the first 20 people on these rows, I'm not making any comment on you, uh, were to all use heroin for 20 days, because there's chemical hooks in heroin, our body would physically need the heroin, and that's what addiction is. We would physically crave it, right? The first hint I got that there may be something wrong with that theory was from a guy called Dr. Gabor Mate, who pointed out to me, if any of us step out onto the street now and we're hit by a car and we break our hip, we'll be taken to hospital and it's very likely we'll be given a lot of diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. It's much better heroin than you're going to score on the streets because it's 100% pure as opposed to street heroin, which is about 5 to 10%, right? You'll be given that heroin for a really long time. That's happening at Johns Hopkins. That's happening at every university in Baltimore. Sorry, every um, hospital in Baltimore. It's happening at every hospital in the United States. Every hospital in the developed world. People are being given a lot of heroin, right? You will have noticed something a bit weird, which is your grandmother was not turned into a junkie by her hip operation. If what we think about addiction is right, those people should be leaving hospital as addicts. That doesn't happen. And I was trying to process this, and I didn't know what to do with it. It seemed so weird. Until I met a man called Bruce Alexander. He's a professor in Vancouver. And Bruce Alexander explained to me the old idea of addiction, the one that I believe, the one that almost all of us believe, comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. If you're feeling a bit sadistic, you can go home and do them yourself. You get a rat and you put it in a cage and give it two water bottles. One is just water and one is water with either heroin or cocaine in it. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself. So there you go. Addiction, it's our theory confirmed. Until 1970s, Bruce comes along and says, hang on a minute, we're putting the rat in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do. Let's try this differently. So Bruce built Rat Park. Rat Park is heaven for rats. Everything your rat could want, it's in Rat Park. It's got cheese, it's got colored balls, it's got friends to have sex with, it's got tunnels. Everything a rat can want is in Rat Park. And they've got both the water bottles, the drugged water and the normal water. And of course they try both because they don't know what's in them. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They hardly ever use it. None of them ever overdose. None of them ever use it in a way that looks compulsive. There's a human experiment with this that I can tell you about in a minute that's really interesting. I think there's a human experiment going all, all, on all around us in Baltimore about this. But um, what Bruce says is, this tells us that both the right-wing theory and the left-wing theories of addiction are wrong. The right-wing theory is you're morally flawed, you're a hedonist, you party too hard, you get hooked. The left-wing theory is the drug takes you over, it hijacks your brain. Bruce says, it's not your morality, it's not your brain, it's your cage. Addiction is an adaptation to your environment. There was a fascinating human experiment going on about this at the same time as Rat Park. It was called the Vietnam War. 20% of American troops in Vietnam were using smack. And if you look at the news reports from the time, they were really worried because they believed the old theory of addiction. So they were like, my God, all these people are going to come back and we're going to have hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States. What happened? All the studies show they came back and almost all of them just stopped. They didn't go to rehab, they didn't go into withdrawal, they stopped. 
Because if you're taken out of a hellish pestilential jungle where you don't want to be and it's a nightmare and you could be killed at any moment and you go back to your nice life in Wichita, Kansas with your friends and your family, it's the equivalent of being taken out of the first cage and being put into the second cage. And this has huge implications for the war on drugs, obviously, because the war on drugs is based on the idea that the chemicals cause the addiction and we need to physically eradicate those chemicals from the face of the earth. Now, I don't think that's possible, physically possible to eradicate these chemicals. We can't keep drugs out of prisons and we've got a walled perimeter and we pay a lot of people to walk around them. So good luck keeping it out of the United States. But you can at least grant that that has a philosophical coherence, right? But if in fact that's not what causes addiction, if in fact the vast majority of people who use those drugs don't become addicted, if in fact isolation and pain are what causes addiction, that forces us to think differently about the drug war because the drug war is built on the idea that what we should do with addicts is inflict more isolation and pain on them. In that prison I went to in Arizona, Tent City, they took me to the hole, that's what they call it, solitary confinement, and these women who were there, these, these desperate addicted women, and I suddenly thought, this is the closest you will ever get to a literal human reenactment of the cage that guaranteed addiction. You know? And we cut them off even more because when they get out, just like with Billie Holiday, they won't be able to work, they won't be able to do the things they love. I think it also has deeper philosophical implications. There's a guy called Peter Cohen, who's a professor, who says we shouldn't use the word addiction, we should use the word bonding. Human beings have an absolutely innate need to bond. And the healthy bond, the bond that most of us have, is with each other. We bond with each other. But if you are deprived of the ability to bond with each other, whether you're traumatized or you're cut off or you're humiliated or isolated, you will bond with something that gives you pleasure. That might be a roulette wheel, that might be a bag of smack, but you will bond with something and you will keep going back to those bonds. If we want like people like the people I love to give up their bond with heroin, we need to give them alternative loving bonds. At the moment, we strip them of those bonds. Bruce talks about how in addiction we talk a lot about individual recovery and that has huge value. We need to talk a lot more about social recovery. Something has gone wrong with us, not just as individuals, but as a group. And we need to think about the fact that we've created a society where a huge number of our fellow citizens cannot bear to be present in their lives without being heavily medicated. I want to tell you two stories about the end of the war on drugs. Good news, the war on drugs has begun to end. And I went to the places where it's begun to end. And if I'm totally honest, I actually put off going for a while because I thought if I go there and it didn't work, this would be the most depressing book ever written. But actually what I saw really blew my mind. In the year 2000, the same time that Lee is standing on the I-95 outside Baltimore and Chino is standing on his corner selling crack, a man called Bud Osborne was living homeless on the streets of the downtown east side of Vancouver. The downtown east side had the, has and had the worst concentration of addicts in North America. It was regarded as the place at the end of the line in the city at the end of the line in North America. People called it Terminal City. And Bud's friends were dying all around him. People would use behind dumpsters so the cops wouldn't see them, but if you use behind a dumpster so the cop doesn't see you and you start to OD, no one else sees you, your body is found two days later. And Bud said, I have to do something about this. I cannot just watch all my friends die. But he also thought, what can I do? I'm a homeless street addict. And Bud had a very small and very simple idea. He got together a load of the addicts and he said, when we're not using, which is most of the time, why don't we just patrol the alleyways? We'll have a timetable. And if we spot someone ODing, we'll call an ambulance. Really small idea. And they started to do it. And a few months passed, and the overdose rate started to really fall on the downtown east side. And that was great in itself, but it also meant the addicts started to think of themselves differently. They started to say, maybe we're not the pieces of rubbish people say we are. Maybe we can do something. And they started to go, loads of them en masse, to public meetings about the menace of the addicts. And they would sit at the back, and they'd listen. And after a while, one of them would put up their hand and they'd say, I think you're talking about us. Is there anything we could do differently? And sometimes people would be really angry and sometimes they'd be quite nice. And they'd say things like, well, you leave your needles lying around. And Bud said, that's fine. We'll extend the parade. We'll collect the needles at the end of every day. And they started to. And then Bud learned about Frankfurt, Germany. They had opened a safe injecting room, a place where you could go and legally use heroin. And the overdose rate had fallen dramatically. And Bud said, right, it's now happened in North America, we're going to make it happen. And they started to stalk a man called Philip Owen, who was the mayor of Vancouver. How can I describe Philip Owen? Picture Mitt Romney. 
Philip Owen was a rich right-wing businessman who had no idea about anyone who'd had any pain in their life, right? And um, they started to follow him everywhere he went. He'd actually said that addicts should all be taken to the local military base and detained there, which gives you some sense of where he was coming from. And they started to follow him everywhere he went, and they carried a coffin. And the coffin had written on it something like, who will die next, Philip Owen, before you open a safe injecting room? And this goes on for two years, and they're starting to get pretty disillusioned because nothing's changing, and people are still dying in huge numbers. And one day, Philip Owen just says, who the hell are these people? And to his eternal credit, he goes incognito to the downtown east side, and he just spends a lot of time with addicts. And his mind is blown. He had no idea. And Philip Owen goes to meet Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, who'd grown up under alcohol prohibition and had a really smart analysis of drug prohibition, and learns from Milton Friedman and Philip Owen comes back to Vancouver and he holds a press conference and he has the chief of police and he has the coroner and he has a representative of the addicts and he says, I'm never going to talk about addiction again without an addict with me because they understand it better than anyone. We're going to open the first safe injecting room in North America. We're going to have the most compassionate drug policies in North America and things are going to change. Just you wait and see. And they open the first injecting room and Philip Owen is deselected by his own party because they're so horrified. But he's, so they select a right-wing candidate who's opposed to it, and that candidate is beaten by a more liberal candidate who wins and keeps it open. Ten years on, the results are in. Overdose has fallen by 80%, 80%. And average life expectancy on the downtown east side has improved by 10 years. You only get stats like that at the end of a war, which is what this is. Bud died last year. He was only in his early 60s, but he'd been a homeless addict in a drug war, and it takes a toll on you. And when he died, they sealed off the streets where he had lived homeless to have a memorial service, and enormous crowds of people came. And huge numbers of people in that crowd knew that they were only alive because of what he had done. If you're listening to me and you're thinking, the drug war is a really big thing and we are powerless and what can we do? I want to tell you, you are so much more powerful than you know. Bud was a homeless street addict. It is hard to think of a more disempowered person. He started a revolution that has led to the saving of thousands of people's lives. The Canadian Supreme Court, as a direct result of his activism, have ruled that addicts have an inalienable right to life, and that includes a safe injecting room, and that can never be taken away now. He did that by starting one day on one street with a bunch of addicts. I also wanted to go to the only place in the world that's decriminalised all drugs, from cannabis to crack, and tell you the story about it. In the year 2000, going back to that one, Portugal had one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin. It's a worse drug problem than in Baltimore. It was mind-blowing. And every year they tried the American way, and every year things got worse. And the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition got together, and they basically said, we can't carry on like this. We can't have a country where 1% of the population is addicted to heroin. Let's figure out what would actually work. So they said, look, why don't we set up a panel of scientists and judges and doctors to figure out what would actually deal with this, and let's agree in advance all the political parties that we'll do whatever they recommend. So it just took it out of politics. It would be like Obama and John Boehner agreeing to set a panel and do what... Well, it's hard to imagine them agreeing to anything, but you know what I mean? It would be like that. And so the panel goes away. I don't think they thought the panel would recommend what it did, but to be fair to them, they stuck by it. The panel comes back and says, decriminalise everything, but, and here's the crucial next step, take all the money we currently spend on arresting drug users, trying drug users, imprisoning drug users, let's use all that money on really good drug treatment. And it's mostly not what we think of drug treatment of in the United States. Some of it was residential rehab, some of it was psychological support, hugely valuable. The biggest thing was learning the lesson of Rat Park. We could all be drunk now. Forget the drug laws. We could all be drinking vodka, right? Why aren't we? It's because we've got something to do. We've got meaning and purpose in our lives. We've got things we want to be present for in our lives, people we want to be present for. The aim of the Portuguese decriminalization was to make sure that every addict in Portugal had something to get out of bed for. So the biggest element of the program was subsidized jobs. Say you had a smack problem. Uh, used to be a mechanic. They'll go to a garage when you're ready and they'll say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. 
One of the things was microloans for, for uh, groups of addicts to set up businesses. One of them set up a removals firm. A group of 15 addicts set up a removals firm. And suddenly they had this incredible support group because if you're one of those 14 and you relapse, the other guys have a really strong incentive to support you and help you and get you clean. And it's been 10, 15, what is it, 14 years now. And again, the results are in. Injecting drug use is down by 50% in Portugal. All the studies show addiction is down, overdose is massively down, HIV transmission is massively down. And one of the most moving interviews I did was with a guy called Juan Figuera. I'm saying that name wrong, I cannot say Portuguese names. They would keep trying to correct me and I would always get it wrong. Um, he led the campaign against the decriminalization. He was the top drug cop in Portugal. And he was thinking, what a lot of people watching this will be thinking, which is surely if you decriminalize, you'll have a massive explosion of use. You have all sorts of problems. And Huao said to me, I'm paraphrasing the exact words are in the book, everything I said would happen didn't happen. And everything the other side said would happen did. And he talked to me about how ashamed he was that he'd spent 20 years arresting and harassing drug users. And he hoped the whole world followed, her, followed Portugal's example. I don't want to get too Billy Graham on you, but I do feel like I've seen the future and it works. And, you know, two, two wars began in 1914, two global wars. One is the war on drugs that hasn't ended, and one was the First World War that lasted for four years. And when I was looking for the centenary of the First World War, I looked at the, you know, that, those amazing images of the graves in Normandy and France, of all these, bo all these graves stretched out for miles and miles. And I tried to imagine if all the people from the war on drugs were buried in one place, who would be there? You'd have Billie Holiday and all the songs she never got to sing. You'd have Chino's mother. You'd have Lee's friends, Lisa and Ed. You'd have Bud's friends who died behind dumpsters. You'd have a lot of people who were loved by people in this room. We've got a choice. We've got another century. We can fill that graveyard with far more people or we can choose a policy of love and compassion that will save the huge number of those lives. It's up to us now. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so we could do questions.